Howdy, you there? Good morning. Hey. What's going on, man? How are you guys doing? Good, good, good. Chilling. Just readjusting to the time zone over here. Trying to fathom how Bcash put on 3x miraculously in like two weeks. Yeah, I totally missed that. Oh, yeah, you got it up there, sweet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I barely looked into it, so I didn't want to say anything that would probably be like not completely correct. And I'm like, oh, you're coming up next. You definitely could talk all about that for probably hours if you wanted to. Well, with the 3x like this, I'm I'm not sure that there's much that you could say that would be definitely certainly correct cuz like how does this happen? Let's let's do a quick measurement here. In 10 days, yeah, this thing went up 211%, which would be slightly over 3x. Um like it's kind of hanging out. Go ahead. Oh, that was it. That was that's like stupid. <laughs> like how does that even happen? Yeah, I mean, obviously it depends on who you ask. If if you ask the Bcash community, um, they'll they'll tell you that it's organic adoption. Like, I don't know if y'all have seen that Pepe meme <laughs> where he's like, oh yeah, yeah. You know, it's like it's the guy. He's like got the green face and he's got his hands on his throat. He's like, oh, organic adoption when price pumps, and then you know when it's crashing, it's like Pepe screaming like no. So uh, yeah, I mean, I, it's hard for me to believe that this is entirely real. Um, like a, a, one thing I usually say is that um, the markets get front run like. All these exchanges have a very good visibility into both on-chain flows and what's happening on their exchanges. So when they see movements being made into um, into whichever coin, they can front run those things. Um, it even happens on like uh, Ethereum as a DEX. Um, you've got these like, uh, well, they call it minor extractable value um, where they can see the orders. They'll get their order in like milliseconds ahead of yours or they'll, or in the case of Ethereum, they'll order the block. But in the case of these exchanges, like they're so shady, they're so dirty, and they don't have hardly any of these regulations. So, I mean, I have to believe they're pulling every dirty trick in the book. Um, but what they'll do, uh, presumably, is they get their orders in milliseconds ahead of yours, and they just do this in aggregate over and over. So there probably is a significant op component of organic buying here that pushed the price up. But did it push it up 3x? No, that was, that was something else going on. Um, I can't remember... Maybe it was BlackRock or it was some really big institution that um, added uh, Bcash to their exchange or I don't think they're alive yet, but they're like a major institution that's that's creating an exchange. And I, I wish I could remember the name of it right now, but they basically said that they're going to also add Bcash because it's it's also not a security. So that's I think, you know, that's kind of what's yeah, going that's on like there. like good sentiment for them. Yeah, Funny, that's, yeah exactly. Somebody said an exchange that's adding it is what you said? Yeah, it's um, it's like I can't, I couldn't tell, and I only really kind of cursory glanced at it, but it looks like a major institution that's forming some kind of exchange for a very limited number of coins. Obviously, Bitcoin was on there. Um, I think maybe it had Litecoin as well, but then they added Bitcoin Cash, and that was like right before this big pump happened. Hmm. So, um, yeah. You know, one thing I, I wanted to kind of salute the Bcash community. Um, they finally have embraced the name Bcash. Like they use it themselves now. So it's. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah no, I always <laughs> felt like, like, guys, what's the big deal? Like, it's it's just a short way of saying it. I, don't, I never understood that. that I, I guess it started originally. It was a pejorative thing that people were trying to. I mean, because they were in a big fight to keep Bitcoin in the title. Right. They wanted yeah, to. Yeah. yeah. No, the branding that. was. So, anyways, but yeah, they, they, I see it on Twitter now. A lot of them, they, they promote Bcash as Bcash, which, which is great. Like, it just rolls off the tongue better. It sounds better. It's better marketing. So, I mean, calling it Bitcoin Cash just never, I mean, what that makes like it confuses people? Yeah. Mm hmm. Uh, whatever. And it's cumbersome to say. Yeah. It's cumbersome. I mean, you know, Monero also has three syllables, cash. but we're very venerable and respected. So, you know, right. we get three syllables. Yeah, but lab labeling it as cash never really made much sense. I mean, I get it's more arguably more cash like than Bitcoin, but it's still, you know, it's not like it's uh, default private fungible, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, to their credit, though, it does seem like um, they've got maybe is it 60 or 70 percent of their transactions are all running rolling through Cash Fusion, which is like a coin join. So the majority of their network is just repeatedly being coin joined. Um, which is more than we could say for Bitcoin. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I didn't know that Stack Wallet talking about adding uh, that to Stack Wallet for Bitcoin Cash. Yeah, it's a pretty good deal. I mean, I guess you know that's what you can do when you have extra space. Actually, have space in your blocks to um, to do some useful stuff. 
Yeah, I didn't realize 60 to 70% of all Bcash transactions go through the Cash Fusion thing. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah, it's it's more than 50%. Um, I don't remember exactly what the number was, but it was it was definitely up there. Now, so did other coins pump as well, or is it just Bcash? Was it um not really? I mean, we we saw some coins like Maker was a big coin that um uh, let's see here. Maker USDT. Maker took a pretty big pump here from I don't know, I think it was like 50%, almost a 2x. Uh as far as some of the other coins that I look at, just like randomly, and this is just a spattering, I only felt like doing eight and I made this script like like nine months ago or something. Um, Soul looks like Soul has been doing pretty good this week. Um, everything else is like just kind of down. Monero's actually overall for the past couple weeks has been no, doing better than most everything else. Um, but overall, like this week in crypto was was pretty just flat in general. Uh, like here's Bitcoin. Um, one thing that I did want to point out to you guys. So this uh, on the bottom here, this is the GBTC premium. So if you all remember, Grayscale has a trust in which they hold Bitcoin. And then they also have a token that represents that trust that's traded on the NASDAQ. They can only buy Bitcoins into the trust, but they're not allowed to sell Bitcoins out of the trust. So what happened was that the token on the NASDAQ started trading and it's always done this. It's always traded at a different price than the value, the spot value of the Bitcoin in the trust. And ideally, you would think it would trade, you know, at the same, but because they can't actually sell Bitcoin out of the trust, it doesn't act properly like a spot ETF, which is obviously what Fidelity and everyone is, BlackRock and everyone is filing for. But one of the big things that um, that sort of clued me in that we were headed for a bear market back in 2021 when everyone was still like uber bullish was that this had dropped to... Um, this had dropped to like negative 20% already. Like you'll see this right here. So when we were like midsummer, October, I, I kept saying, where's the institutional FOMO? Why wouldn't they buy a Bitcoin, um, the GBTC token or, you know, tradable ETN on the stock market at like a 20% discount or 15% discount. And this thing has only continued to get more negative. So it means that the stock market only believes that this, um, <laughs> that the, that the value of the spot, um, sorry, the value of, Bitcoin, at least as tradable on the stock market, is like minus 50%. So one thing that we really would want to see happen um, to be convinced that maybe we're going into a new bull market, we really want to see this thing come back to a zero point. Because for most of the history of, of um, Bitcoin being on or the, the grayscale Bitcoin trust, and I know it's sorry, I know it's kind of weird with the language because um, it's technically not an ETF, even though you can trade it on the stock market, like it's an ETN but it's not a spot ETF. They're not allowed to like buy and sell and track the price of Bitcoin exactly um, like a proper ETF would, which is again, why we get this like weird oscillations where sometimes it's trading like, well, like you can see this is 60% right here. And at some points it's even trading twice the value of the actual Bitcoin in that trust. So anyways, um, you can see this goes back to like 2015. So to be convinced that we're like actually headed into a new bull market, like on a, on a more long-term basis, you really want to see this thing go back at least to zero because in the past, you know, it's actually traded higher than, than the spot value. So an interesting that has been ha interesting thing that has been happening um, for the past couple of weeks, really ever since BlackRock filed for their ETF um, is, is that this has been trending up. So um, right now, this is like one of the few really major positive signs that I see um, for crypto. So we'll talk a little bit more maybe about, um, I don't think that the top is in, like if I had to give it odds, I don't think that the top is in for Bitcoin um, or for crypto in general, but I don't like these kind of BART patterns. So, um, okay, we had like this descending wedge and then we, you know, we just with extreme momentum just broke out of the top and, and basically what amounts to a BART chart. Uh, and so this is like Bart Simpson, right? You, you've got the left head, you, you kind of do this choppy thing. And usually when you say Bart, you imply that you're going to come back down to the other side. I don't necessarily think that we're that that's going to happen, but this chart definitely has, it's this, this is the same old BS that we've seen over and over again, where markets just massively pump in one go, and then they just trade sideways and flat. Um, and then there's like these fake out wicks to the downside. There's these fake out wicks to the upside. I don't like this price action because to me, organic price action that supports continuous strong price movement um, should have pullbacks and it shouldn't just be the same pattern that we see over and over again. Like we can go back here. Um, you know, we can see the same kind of thing happened here. Okay. We spiked up sideways and then kind of sideways action come down 
Uh, and then kind of the same thing again, spike up massively. I mean, I know that was the, the banking crisis, but then everything was just sideways, sideways, sideways. There's like this fake out to the top side and then it comes right back down, right? This is, uh, this right here is kind of like a BART pattern. Um, and so then things just kind of bled out for a while until out of nowhere, I guess, organically, the market just decided on <laughs> June 20, June 20th, that it's just going to mega pump, you know, to the upside. And it's not even really a mega pump. It's only like 15%. Anyways, I just don't like the way the action feels like if this really was this strong, like if it was that much organic buying and people were just that excited about Bitcoin, don't you think there should have been some follow through? We should have at least hit the most obvious, um, resistance no, it was me. I, I bought uh, all that Bitcoin. <laughs> that was you <laughs> damn bro what why why like i, I trust you got that, that it wasn't from an arrow i trust it was like from an outside job it's so i can trade it to an arrow so it's gonna okay. go back down in a day cool oh okay um all right well you heard it here first uh got the inside tips be careful about the sec they might come after you for insider trading or something you know just uh just be care be careful you know they're they're, they're going after people okay Anyways. for legal reasons that was a joke <laughs> yeah. uh, okay, I guess let's take a look at um, the the dominance on, on, on Bitcoin right here. So, uh, you know, again, we kind of peaked out of this, like the first spot that we thought we might, which was kind of that, um, that April low years and years ago, 2019, before it really shot up. I really don't expect that Bitcoin is going is to do this right here, where it, um, in the mid-cycle peak last, uh, last bear market, um, that would be June of 2019. Um, you know, Bitcoin just shot to the top side and then dominance just like crush it. And one of the reasons that dominance crushed it so much back then was this was this um, this scam called plus token Ponzi. They had gobbled up like one percent of all Bitcoin. Um, and then the day that they were shut down by Chinese authorities, so-called authorities, uh, was the day that the market peaked, like the literal day, which was June 19th. Uh, maybe it was, I think it was June 19th, 2019. Maybe it was June 17th. Doesn't matter. Um, right at the end of June in 2019, the day that they shut down that scam is the day that Bitcoin peaked um, for that like mid cycle pump. So this is one of the big reasons we saw dominance uh, back then do this just massive run because they gobbled up 1% of the Bitcoin and they traded hardly anything else. So um, unless there's some kind of like major Ponzi or fundamental reason, I, I just I'm not sure that we'll see the dominance do this kind of move towards 72%. I think that somewhere in the neighborhood where we're at currently is probably the most we could expect. If we really wanted to get um, like, I don't know, fantastical about our predictions here, we could probably break through that and maybe get up to 57, right? Just because that's such an easy spot right there. And sometimes this kind of stuff does happen like this happened, right? This, this dominance pump happened in 2020. That was mostly just market makers um, trying to convince the market that it was game on right before we entered the 2021 uh, blow off long-term blow-off season um so yeah that's that's basically that where the crypto markets are at ethereum bitcoin is maybe forming a bottoming pattern it was strong up here and then it just kind of crashed to the downside again with all the sec threats and, and all that stuff um but you could also say that this right here is forming a very long-term bullish divergence so you know we're looking at this you've got higher lows on the momentum scores but you've got lower lows on the price so this is already looking potentially like um, bullish divergence. And especially if we see Ethereum Bitcoin revisit this spot right here, um, we should definitely expect that that's going to go up long term. Um, still need, you know, probably a few more weeks to confirm that. We really do want to see if that's going to come back to this line. But this kind of action right here in combination with um, with this this divergence would really signal that Ethereum is, is going to be strong against Bitcoin um, going into sort of like the more long term towards the end of the year. Uh, maybe into early next year. Uh, let's go ahead and take a look at Monero in that case. So last year, uh, last week, I showed you guys these moving averages. So that's what all this this white stuff is here. Actually, let me uh, let's hide the drawings. Okay, so that makes it a little bit easier to see. And we'll turn that off as well. Okay, so you can basically see again, this is like a long term chart, but we're we basically Monero price just kind of trended between these falling, these sort of compressing moving averages. And this is not any one particular moving average because it's arbitrary which one you select. Um, so you just overlay all of them. You'll notice that there's kind of like these gaps. Um, that's because I have some cool filtering built into this so that it doesn't. Um, actually, let me just show you what it looks like without the filter. And then it'll it'll look like normal moving averages after we do this. Okay, so this is just a whole bunch of different moving averages uh, overlaid on top of each other. So 
Um, basically, like, yeah, I mean, there's kind of like this cluster that sort of formed a support, and then we've just been trending. You can see there's sort of this other cluster right here, and price is really just oscillating, trending around that. I would probably suspect that until a new a new bull market breaks out, you know, like maybe next year, um, maybe 2025, uh, I, I would expect that price is probably going to be mostly constrained um, by this band, by this sort of compression here. Um, you know, we, we really have had the Monero price, the USD price. You can see that it's it's basically becoming constrained in terms of volatility. So at some point, usually when your volatility becomes constrained, um, that's usually like kind of a compression. It's it's kind of like the theory on this is that the market is always searching for the true price of an asset. And so eventually, and the, well, I should say two things, the market is always searching for the true price of an asset, which kind of means implies speculation of some sort. So what will happen is you'll get some big volatile move and then you'll have lowering volatility for the next months or even sometimes years to come where the market sort of settles on a price that they think the asset is. But at some point, the volatility is so low and so much time has passed that people reevaluate their speculation and the market and aggregate speculates towards a new price direction. Um, so it, so it acts kind of like a spring when you see this compressing volatility. So maybe something like that, you know, and then it ultimately breaks out and has another major volatile move. Um, at least that's like some of the theory on volatility analysis, uh, for, for markets. So, um, yeah, I mean, at, at the moment, you know, Monero had a, had a really nice move. We talked about that last week and we've kind of just been flat ever since. Um, I don't think this move is over. Uh, I think it's very, very likely we could probably get to 190, um, you know, to the top of these moving average clusters. Um, maybe there's some other short-term patterns to try and find in here. Uh, let's go down to, I guess this is the two hour. Yeah. I mean, there's really, there's not too much exciting going on with this chart. We could, um, let's mute those. All right. And then we could try and like, I don't know, draw some lines. I'm not sure how valid any of these lines are. Uh, lines are always slightly questionable, slightly dubious. Um, yeah, there's kind of like slightly a channel going on here. Uh, again, nothing exciting. Um, one cool thing that we have seen is that XMR has done continued to do well against Ethereum. Um, I really, I really did think that. Um, um, well, I wasn't too sure. Like, if it seemed like Ethereum was strong, but I guess with um, all the SEC stuff, um, a lot of a lot of the movement and hype for for some of this stuff really got put on hold. Um, which Monero has kind of been a beneficiary to the tune of about fifteen percent. So this definitely right here now looks um, suspiciously like a bottoming pattern. Almost, you would almost want to call that a W pattern, but not quite. Um, I don't think you could call it a W, you know, so kind of down here, up. Uh, and then right now we're kind of like retesting that level, um, this spot right here. So, uh, yeah, I mean, Monero versus Ethereum is looking okay-ish. Uh, not not as good as we might hope. The, uh, the price divergences have been basically flat. Nothing really exciting here. Uh, we left off. Uh, last week we would have left off right around here. So kind of just been oscillating around zero. Um, not really anything to look at there. One cool thing that we can look at, however, is the market cap dominance at XMR.D. So, okay, so we've got, um, you know, kind of like this broadening structure right here. We almost slightly broke through. Uh, and again, you know, so we kind of almost broke through, came back down, and then it stopped halfway and we're already on our way up to this line again. So that signals that this line um, is probably getting ready to be broken on a more permanent basis. Um, but the thing that stuck out to me that that I noticed today was um, you might call this a head and shoulders, or I should say an, an inverse head and shoulders, right? So that sort of left, uh, right shoulder here on the inverse portion is, is being formed. And uh, I mean, yeah, hypothetically, that, that could imply a target. Uh, let's just do that measurement here. Uh, so those would be the shoulders. Actually, I think I did that wrong. Those would be the shoulders right there. And then we would measure from the top to where that is. And that would imply, hypothetically, a target of another like two, uh, three to four X from an price versus the rest of crypto. Um, now, whether we could actually make it that far, right, whether XMRD could actually go from 0.26 um, of the crypto market, 0.26% of the crypto market, um, you know, all the way up to, uh, I guess that would be about 0.8. You know, I'm not sure if we could really make it that far, but, um, but maybe, right? Like, uh, I mean, th there is stuff going on with Monero that, that, um, that could signal to us that, that important things could be happening with our price. And, um, it's another reason I hodl because I mean, with the way that there's some shady stuff that goes on in the background, I just refuse to be left out in the cold. If Monero is going to make some mega pump out of nowhere, um, 
you know, and it stands to reason that that it might do that at some point. Um, who knows if some big name person like he has some big need of Monero or uh, <laughs> CZ gets shut down and he knows that his only escape hatch is to get into the only real digital cash out there, uh, you know, et cetera. Anyways, um, I just thought it was interesting that we've got kind of an inverse head and shoulders pattern, a very, very large inverse head and shoulders starting from 2021, really starting from the end of 2020. Um, yeah, so that's that's pretty cool. Uh, awesome. And then Monero Bitcoin. Uh, go ahead uh, if when you guys had something to, to say. No, 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 that's that's exciting to see. I mean, how uh, how well formed is that is that pattern? Like, is it like? Uh... I would say it's pretty good. Like, okay. honestly, like that's that definitely looks like this is definitely looking like a head and shoulders. We kind of need to see a little bit more follow through on this side, you know, up here just to to sort of confirm that. But I mean, that that's definitely that, that that's a pretty well formed head and shoulders. It's not perfect, but um, you could definitely call it that. And again, you know, all of these like and people will say TA is just astrology for dudes and um, they're not entirely wrong. Uh, it is. It's it's useful. It's statistical. It doesn't always play out. Um, things can go to a totally different side. Um, it's also why I think that you know you should be integrating TA with other analysis like macro analysis, um, sentiment analysis, things like that. Um, I can't remember who it was, but I, I remember asking or, or reading someone. It, it was a video that I watched, and uh, I don't know. It was like some old like insider stock stock market guy. Um, did a lot of like liquidity providing, market making, stuff like that, um, and also worked for hedge funds. And so someone asked him, he said, listen, do you, um, how much do you guys as a hedge fund, you know, you're investing billions and billions of dollars, do y'all use technical analysis? And he said, well, the thing is when you're dealing with that much money, you end up moving the market. And for the most part, like we don't have access, like the short-term traders, yeah, you can find little patterns, you can get in and out of the market. You're not going to induce slippage. You're not going to move the market against yourself, et cetera. But when you're dealing with this kind of cash, um, you really have to make uh, fundamental decisions on where to invest the cash. So you you look at the companies, you decide you know which ones are going to be worthwhile over the course of very long periods of time, you know years, even decades. And he said, now we will use TA sometimes. He said if they tell us, okay, it's time to get into a position for a long term position, um, and we want you to acquire this position over the course of a few months. He said, yeah, yeah, we'll use TA to try and. Um, time our buys to try and get the best entry price we can. Um, but what I took from that is that, yeah, I mean, even the big guys know that TA has some validity to it. Um, it's just that unless you're, you know, it, if you're, you, if you're playing around with say a million dollars or less, like you're really not going to move the markets that much against you. And you could, you can exploit TA more than, um, you know, more than the big hedge funds. So anyways, that's just kind of like a side, a side piece on TA. Um, Oh, you know, I'll say one more thing about it. So the regression analysis that we've that we've talked about since like forever here, um, that's also technical analysis. That's all that is is um, that's just applying numbers and lines and stuff to to a chart, uh, and, and it works. Like it works, and you can prove that it works statistically, right? You can I can prove in a very like clear fashion with statistics that we've been using for decades, really a hundred years, um, that it is better than chance. Right. And that's really the only the only reason that you use TA is that you're trying to get something better than chance. So, um, yeah, the uh, let's just pull it up really quick just so that everyone can make sure that they can see what what I mean here. Uh, I don't know what that line is for. OK, this is that regression analysis on Bitcoin. We've been looking at this forever. It basically nailed the top to within one percent uh, back in April 2021. And again, this is statistically provably better than chance like this isn't. It doesn't and it doesn't have to hold up like it can break down like it's just a statistical model, but it does help you make decisions in a way that are going to get you better than chance decisions. So that's the only reason we do TA. Um, yes, it is slightly like astrology for guys, especially if done in dubious in dubious fashion. But um, OK, you know, just a side rant on why TA is, is actually important. Uh, and it's one among many pieces that you should integrate into your analysis. Um, yeah, OK, so with that statistics at the end of the day, but I mean, the, the I guess there's two problems. One, people not properly applying it and to people using their own biases as they do it right like that's the hard oh, part. oh yeah take your your own personal Man. bias out of the interpretations right yeah i mean uh, i think i posted on twitter a few days ago or maybe like last week like if you really want to you know if you really want to like uh hit the ego and like try and um figure out where your biases are and, and all kinds of stuff and see if your market paradigm actually lines up with reality 
start trying, you know, try to become a trader, right? You don't even have to put that much money into it. Like if you have a portfolio of say a hundred thousand dollars, put $1,000 uh, into a trading account and then see if you can like time the market, um, at least on a weeks to months long basis, right? Like, okay, if you're doing algorithmic short-term purely TA trading, um, you're not going to put your market paradigm up against any real test because you're just doing an algorithmic thing. But like, if you really want to like see if your market paradigm is good and reveal your biases and like reveal where you might have some ego getting in the way uh, and emotions getting in the way, like start trading. <laughs> You'll find really quickly um, like just how much you have to work on that to keep it from um, like becoming a hindrance. Uh, I know. I mean, I I'm just speaking from the school of hard knocks here. I've done this like a, a lot, <laughs> you know, where you, you learn eventually to like look at your emotions and say, okay, what is my, my emotion saying? And how is that different from what my intellect is saying? And what kind of signal does that give me? So, you know, uh, maybe speaking a little bit about emotions, let's let's talk a little bit about the sentiment. So um, there's a BRICS meeting in August. The BRICS are the Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And they've been alive. They've been around meetings since like before Bitcoin existed. And they've been talking about replacing the dollar since forever. Um, but this time... In August, I promise they're going to do it. They're going to release a BRICS currency, gold-backed BRICS currency, and uh, that's going to take us into the, the promised land. And so I expect, um, and obviously I'm joking here, but I expect these kinds of narratives to start popping up around August um, when this meeting happens. And I've actually seen the sentiment almost in unison for the entirety of crypto turn positive, like all the old rats are coming out of the woodwork. You know, it's, I'm seeing their their tweets now, and they're they're not so ashamed of themselves anymore. <laughs> they, they should they should uh, they definitely still should be. Um, but anyway, so I I am seeing kind of like sentiment change into a unison direction that does make me a bit concerned. That doesn't mean that I think it's necessarily the top here. Um, I do think on balance of probabilities, Bitcoin has another higher high to make. I even have some friends that I respect that think it's going to like 45 or 50. In my mind, that's too easy. Too many people have a break even level there. Um, it's, too, it's just like a hundred thousand in 2021, a hundred thousand was way too easy. And like a bunch of normie friends that I like, cause you know, I sample people in telegram groups and stuff like that and, and friends in real life. And a lot of them were like, uh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take some profit at a hundred thousand, you know, but, oh, but really I might just take it at like 90,000, right. Front run it. And then we didn't even get to 90,000. Like we only made to 70. So, okay. If, if something similar happens here with this like big 50,000 number, that's starting to emerge in people's minds, um, are we going to make it to 50? Are we even going to make it to 45? So that's, you know, you, it, it's hard to trade off of that, um, you know, but it is kind of one piece that I look at. I don't like when I see the, the market get totally bearish or totally bullish. Um, that's that's usually spells opportunity for some deep pockets insiders. Um, so anyways, we've got the, the, the bricks thing coming up in August. Uh, that should, you'll probably start seeing more of that pop up on like Twitter and stuff. Um Let's see. Oh, Brazil releases some code for an ERC-20 CBDC. Ooh. So um, it's like it's all written in Solidity. So Solidity is like the native coding language of Ethereum. Uh, so it looks like Brazil is is going to experiment with a CBDC on top of Ethereum, which is, of course, should be no surprise to anyone here. Um, that's like basically what kind of the things we're, we've been expecting for for months now. Um, with, this is huge. Like in my mind, especially if they actually make this thing go live on Ethereum as a layer two, holy crap, like that's massively more important than the El Salvador um, compromised Chivo wallet that they did. So uh, important little piece of news there. Um, next week, we're going to get some CPI numbers. Uh, I, th those have mattered less and less lately. Uh, actually, let's just take a look at it really quick. Um, if we get some major drop, like we could we could definitely see like if there is a major drop we could definitely see um, if I can find it oh it was right here of course um, yeah I mean that could that really like has the potential to propel the markets to another higher high um, I'm not sure that it will drop but uh, okay so the white is the CPI numbers we're basically almost back in trend like so from this entire area from the early 2000s CPI is basically back in trend um, the producer price index is now back in trend in blue. This the orange line, which is the core inflation, and that's the one the Federal Reserve cares about the most, is a lot more sticky. That's that's going to be hard. You can see that's still pretty high. It, it's it was only since like the early 90s that was actually this high. So really, it's that core inflation that we need to see come back down. <clears throat> I wouldn't expect too much to happen in that regard. Um, the numbers could come down, but maybe the market will trade some volatility around the release of the numbers. But I don't think it will be too big of a deal. 
Um, and uh, let's go ahead and take a look at the dollar because we did talk about the bricks and replacing the dollar allegedly. Uh, that's the S and P. All right, here's the dollar index. Okay, so um, really, like nothing too big has happened since last week. Uh, we kind of said, hey, this flattened out. You know, we'll probably get some resistance here, maybe like chop sideways. You know, I don't think the dollar is quite ready to break out just yet. It tends to move on slow timelines. Um, I mean, for one, just because it's such a massive market, there's so much liquidity there um, that these markets don't move as fast. Um, you know, whenever you have massive liquidity, it's hard to move the price. So, but still, nonetheless, the dollar is is setting up here um, for some kind of rebound to the top side. I think eventually, uh, it could be could be September, October, could be August. But um, you know, again, like as we see the narratives and the sentiment move more and more clearly in one direction, the more outlandish it gets, the more obnoxious the uh, you know the players get there about uh, about their moon bags. Um, you could just you can expect that that those are all counter signals, right? Those are signals of a top. So we'll be watching the dollar very closely. Um, it would be amazing to see the dollar break out and then also see Bitcoin make a new all time high and then see the dollar keep going up because that's what happened last time in uh, in 2021 before the right before the end of the bull market. Um, we've got the uh, repurchase agreements and the interesting thing to me here is that repurchase agreements have continued to go down um even recently by i guess we'll just call that about 200 billion dollars 150 200 billion dollars even as the stock markets are kind of struggling oops, sorry uh as the stock markets are struggling to make new higher highs right this is the nasdaq um things came up so even though that that the uh, reverse repos have been coming down which is kind of like cash leaving the federal reserve just parked there for a, a low interest rate um, where's that cash going exactly? Because it doesn't look like it went into the stock market all that much. Um, and then if we take a look at bonds, uh, here we go. Here's the 10-year bond and the rest of the bond market looks very similar. Um, so this is the rates, right? The interest rate, it is inverse to the value of bonds overall. So overall, the value of bonds has been dropping as the rates have been rising. Um, so that money hasn't been going into bonds. It hasn't been going into the stock market. Maybe it's been going into new bonds. I really, I don't know, but uh, I'm curious about where that money actually has gone. Um, this is kind of an important chart right here that we should stop for a moment. The the 10-year yield um, formed this like falling wedge here, and it just broke out of that um, this past week. So um, I think this is the market anticipating at least one or two more uh, rate hikes from the Federal Reserve. Um, these tend to be a little bit more stable, but sometimes they can just like make crazy big moves. These like this crazy rise in interest rates was not a good thing. Normally, when when bond rates rise, that means stock that money is leaving bonds and going into the stock market. Um, but uh, I mean, I don't know where again, like, OK, if there's money leaving bonds and the stock market is flat or slightly down um, and then gold is also basically flat here uh, for the whole week. I, I'm just curious where that money might be going. Um, there's probably an answer there somewhere, and I just haven't been able to think of it. Um, so with that, I, I think that's... Go to Bcash. Go to Bcash. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Hmm. That's a good one. You should post that. You, you'll you'll be an instant favorite in the Bcash community. I'll have to buy some Bcash first. Uh, <laughs> cool, Matt. What, what else we got? I, I mean, that, that was a extensive overview there Any, yeah sorry I, I didn't I, I was like i was it's gonna be short today i don't have much to say oops <laughs> trading lessons with body yeah no worries uh anything else you want to throw out there um uh, let's see you know i always forget to check the youtube comments so is there any questions there i i, I haven't looked so bad uh, YouTube one guy was saying well the bcash pump uh what did he say uh, here we go EDX EDX. Markets. What's that? Go ahead. Launch of EDX markets backed by Fidelity, Citadel, Schwab, which listed BCH and BSV. Yeah. Oh, man, maybe you should get some Satoshi's vision going on. <laughs> they listed BSV. <laughs> what the? <laughs> so I guess BSV. I mean, take a pump too. I would think. You know what? Let's check it. I mean, I can understand. Okay, I, I can get Bcash. Like I, I got that, but BSV. What the hell, guys? Like how? How is Get that a little out there for sure. Uh, oh, they only had a, a one and a half X pump. Mm. Wah, wah. Mm. <laughs> only one and a half. I mean, yeah, still, BCH still. is understandable. Like Bitcoin Cash was the main fork 
you know, in a very contentious time um, that is still like, I mean, from our perspective, the, the, the non fork side was basically wrong. Like the block size should have been raised by now. Um, mm -hmm. But then like BC BSV was just a liar. That's like a vexatious litigant in court. That's it's, a, it's amazing that, um, that Craig Wright hasn't been sanctioned. Like, cause he gets on stand and he lies and he says all this stuff. Like, how's he not been sanctioned or faced consequences for all the lies that he's told in court? Um, it makes me wonder about who he might really be. Oh, who do you think he might really be? I don't know. Like, how does he just jet around the whole world lying in court and not face consequences? What kind of people can do that, you know? And who are those yeah. people connected to usually? Um, but the, well, what's the uh, what's the motive? Like, what is he trying to do? Like, what are they or the people behind him trying to do? Like, what's the? I think. I, I mean, if I, I was think... go if I was going to go crank theory, I would say that um, they want him to basically cause problems and disruptions. Um, he serves like one a polarizing figure to sort of harden the maximalist side into their maximalist camp and be like, oh no, look how obviously stupid he is, and we're right, and you know, and then also to um, divide the Bcash community as well. Um, because you can't have, you know, you don't want Bitcoin actually becoming usable uh, or and or popular with number go up enough that encourages people to adopt and use it. Um, you know, you would like people to stay in the compromise chain, which which doesn't have any scaling where Lightning's not working. It's been five years, uh, and now there's like DGen NFTs. I, I'm not like I don't even like I wouldn't even put myself fifty percent on that theory. <laughs> Maybe I put fifty percent, but I do just stop and ask myself, hmm, like could there be something going on? Could this guy be like a some kind of like agent, you know, disinformation agent or, um, you know, something along those lines? Maybe, I don't necessarily. But think if he is, he's doing a bad job. <laughs> like he's not having much of an impact. You know, he's just become. It's just him and the project are just considered clownish, right? I mean, yeah, well, the BSV project definitely is considered clownish, but. For the time period that he was, he's not really relevant anymore, but for the time period he was relevant, um, he did a pretty good job of like hardening emotionally Maxis into to hating Bcash. Um, and he did a pretty good job of splitting, maybe not that great of a job, but he did split the, the Bcash community um, after the fact. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. I feel like his, yeah, he's just he a, was a crazy narcissist who was, <laughs> you know, early in, in Bitcoin. Yeah, this is probably one of those. Um, yeah. You know, the simple explanation is the yeah, yeah, is the real explanation. Yeah, that's where I would go with that. I mean, I do like to entertain. You know, the multiple possibilities there, just because. Yeah, you know, if you hadn't thought of it, you can. You know, you just want to at least consider it. But yeah. I don't know. All right, man. Uh, let's let's move it on. Move it on. Move it on. I want to I want to get outside today. It's hot as hell here in New York. Um, cool. Well, sweet. Uh, thanks thanks for the opportunity. Thanks for the time. Yeah, body, thank you so much, man. Appreciate it.